just to sort of um, introduce us properly, um, I'm Amanda Benson and I'm the <coughs> Curriculum Development Officer at the Cooperative College. So I do quite a lot of um, developing new courses and updating existing courses, particularly moving on to um, like online delivery and Zoom delivery. So adapting learning materials um, for, for sort of multi, multifaceted delivery, <laughs> blended learning. Great, and um, I'm Angela Colbrook. I'm the Learning and Development Manager here at the college. Um, and I've been in a, an employed role at the college for nine years. Prior to that, I was a freelance trainer. Um, a lot of my work with uh, Cooperative College, Cooperative <coughs> organizations and some um, FE work as well and then prior to that I, um, I did actually work for uh, what is now the cooperative group the big national co-op based in Manchester which formerly CRS which was more of a regional um, cooperative so I've, I've sort of had all sorts of cooperative experience in various uh, guises um, and for me I'm excited this year that, that uh, we, we really developed our online offer of which the CCIN induction is part but we're also and developing um, online workshops and, uh, as well. Um, it has been accelerated by COVID, as you can imagine, um, but it was always in our strategy, but it's, it's great that we have actually uh, developed those products um, and, and we're sort of able to access many more people um, that way. Uh, we, do, we do intend to continue, as we've just been talking about, with a face-to-face -face delivery when that time, uh, when we're allowed to do that once again, <coughs> very much be, um, based on a, on a blended learning approach. So looking forward to telling you about the, the CCIN induction and um, that we've developed for the, the network and also, you know, to tell you about opportunities of working with us. And um, I just want, I should add as well, I, I used to work over in um, Tameside as in, the, in the CVS. So uh, when Brenda's talking about um, their experiences over there, I'm, you know, it's, uh, it's very close to my heart. <laughs> So in this session, what we're going to be covering is, um, you know, just sort of introducing a side case study, and that's going to be Brenda that's going to be talking about that. And then we, as, as Angela was saying, we're going to do a quick walkthrough of the CCIN induction and the demonstration of the Cooperative College learning platform. Um, and then we hopefully will have time to do a little um, interactive activity um, looking at um, population and place in your local area. So that's just to sort of like, you know, to get people thinking and reflecting on, you know, the ways in which we can change the way that we work in pop with populations and places um, more cooperatively. And then at the end, we'll have a quick um, feedback and Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Councillor <coughs> Warrington, who is the executive leader of Cameside Metropolitan Borough Council. I'm just going to stop my share so that we go back to our screens. So hand over to you, Brenda. Okay. Well, thank you, Amanda. And uh, thank you for the invitation uh, today to uh, join in this workshop. It, it really is uh, a really interesting concept. And I, I think you, you've asked me to briefly take you through our journey uh, in Tameside um, uh, from really not being a member of, of uh, CCIN to becoming a cooperative council. But I have to say that th this journey uh, is, is something that I sort of concluded, I suppose. Uh, I know that um, my predecessor uh, some years ago mentioned that he would like Tameside to look at becoming a cooperative council. Uh, but unfortunately, and I have no idea what... Uh, what served to, to, to not continue with, with that exploration at the time. Um, it just didn't happen. And, and it was always one of the things that I felt we needed to do and should be doing. And so when I became leader, and, and that was in January 2018, I actually made it one of my top priorities uh, to, to uh, look at and um, I was determined that we were going to become a cooperative council and we achieved that I mean we went through the whole process which I have to say was uh, it was it was really you know very pleasant to go through it the people that we dealt with were brilliant you know they helped us along and you know we, we did have a lot of buy-in you know from uh, not not just the members not just the councillors 
but also from officers who felt that it was right for us to be going on this journey as well. And so it, it, it was, it, we were really pushing at open doors, if you like. And so we went through the whole process. And in 2019, I'm pleased to say that we were accepted and, you know, we achieved our ambition of becoming a cooperative council. And really, I, I think we, we, you know, wanted to build on our existing strengths, but we also wanted to draw on new opportunities. And of course, we wanted to explore the kind of support that we believed existed uh, through the CCIN network. And, and that really is amazing, I have to say. And so we, we do try to demonstrate our commitment to cooperative identity and profile and, you know, build on our existing strengths and values as a local authority, which have been, you know, quite long standing, to be honest. But becoming a, a CCIN member has meant a, a further exploration and engagement with um, values based approaches. And as a council, we, we have always tried to be proactive. We have always done our best to involve our residents in uh, that, you know, the decision making processes. And we hope that residents feel that their voice is both heard and listened to uh, and can very often uh, influence the decisions that we help we have to make. And of course, you know, we have to shape our public facing arrangements and we do that with our residents. We don't do it to them. We do it with them. And we, we find that um, more often than not, it works very, very well. And I can't say that we're massively different, you know, now to what we used to be. But what I would say is that we now consciously think about cooperative values. They don't happen by accident, obviously. And um, we, we have sort of started to get that message embedded uh, in everyone, in, in our councillors, in our officers, you know, that cooperative values are important to us and they must be embedded in pretty much all of the work that we do. And now, of course, we're, we're finding out much more about other councils' practices, how they do things. And of course, there are always benefits uh, to learning how, how other uh, areas work, uh, because no one has the luxury of always being right, do they? And I think, you know, sharing good practice is something that we've always been quite happy to do. And so uh, we, we, we do already, hasn't happened for quite some time, I don't think, but, you know, we do have, um, you know, those um, peer, uh, peer to peer arrangement, you know, that, uh, in fact, we, we were starting one as the pandemic came about. And unfortunately, it's had to be abandoned, you know, until such time as we, we can get back to it. Uh, but, we, you know, we do share those um, peer arrangements. So we do continue uh, to, to, to do lots of things. I, I think um, the CCIN policy prototype program, the continuation of developing our Living Well at Home uh, social care scheme uh, in consultation with other CCIN members is something that we're working on now. And over the last year, we've, we've brought as many stakeholders as possible along on our journey. And the first month of our membership, we actually had our cooperative summit, if you remember. Um, we, we were really pleased to uh, engage in that. And that brought together existing projects across our borough and certainly satisfied the principles of cooperation. And all of our councillors um, are included and, you know, that th they all do buy into it. So um, we, we, we do have what we term elected member development sessions, you know, where we all get together and, you know, informally have um, discussions about different things. And one of them, of course, is um, based on cooperative councils. And what we also do, we have discussions with our trade unions, with our Tameside Youth Council, with our neighbourhood forums. We, we do try to embrace um, lots of uh, different uh, I suppose representatives of, of the different communities that we have and what we are uh, working on at the moment although again 
uh, like lots of things, been a bit delayed because of the COVID pandemic. Um, we are going to start uh, an elected member steering group. Um, I'll chair it initially uh, and, you know, let's just see how far we can take that over the, the next few months and, and indeed years. And I, th I think, you know, what it's meant for us is that the CCIN has become, you know, a bit of a status for Tameside. You know, we do badge ourselves as a cooperative council. And of course, that is alongside um, other councils in Greater Manchester. I know that Rochdale, who was very much a pioneer of the cooperative movement, and uh, Oldham are both uh, uh, cooperative councils. Um, I'm not sure whether any others have, um, you know, done the journey as yet, but um, hopefully we're trying to persuade others to do so if they haven't already. So the cooperative values are now manifesting themselves across our wider organisation. Uh, we have um, a fully integrated health and care uh, system in Tameside. Uh, you know, you, you really can't um, put a piece of paper between the two. Uh, and we work very closely with them. And our CCG body, um, again, you know, uh, have started to buy into the values that we promote. We're in regular dialogue um, with STAR. STAR is a procurement service that a number, again, of uh, Man Greater Manchester Councils all uh, jointly uh, use, which is, again, very beneficial to all of us. And we do insist that STAR uh, em embrace cooperative values on any, uh, any of the work that they do for us in terms of procurement. So, you know, again, we, we, we can influence in, in many ways. And certainly, e examples, um, uh, include, uh, I, th I think one of the things that we, we've promoted in the past um, with you uh, is the, the partnership that we've developed. It's the Tameside and Glossop Partnership Engagement Network, to give it its title. Uh, we call it PEN for short. And what that is, it's, um, again, and we do it virtually now. It, it was uh, an, uh, an aspect where people would come together. But of course, at the moment, we'd, we still do it virtually. But we have residents, we have stakeholders, we have um, businesses, we have community groups, the voluntary sector, our officers, uh, the health service, you know, from all different types of prof professional. And they all come together, uh, you know, for, for either a morning or an afternoon, you know, to talk about and influence the work of public services generally. And really what they do, they will report to us you know, what's working, what's not working, what we need to, you know, take another look at maybe. But what we do is we make sure that they're able to have that voice, able to influence ongoing decision making. And we, we've covered many, many topics already uh, in that group, um, all to do with public services and, and how it needs to um, really w work in with, with our residents. And another example of this approach is the cooperative network infrastructure uh, that was founded in 2018. Uh, we work with partner organisations and build a new advanced digital infrastructure. And that serves the public sector, businesses and citizens again. Um, it's the thin layer model, they call it, which, we, which pioneered in, in Tameside. And, you know, we, we rapidly deployed new dark fibre infrastructure, but managed to avoid some of the complications and downsides of, uh, that are associated with other public sector demand aggregation. And, and so, again, you know, it's something that we, we now can pretty much sell, if you like, but done on a cooperative basis. And, and again, it's proving quite popular. And uh, we, we have um, got... Uh, Manchester and Blackpool, you know, are very much um, working with us now on this. And the focus of building back greener, which I think is, is very much on everyone's agenda these days, um, is, is something that we're very passionate about. We had our own uh, green summit in 2018, I think it was around November time that year, which followed the Greater Manchester Green Summit, the first one that Mayor Andy Burnham um, hosted. And um, 
you know, again, we're very, very keen to continue to promote the need for us to address, uh, you know, green initiatives. And we, we have passed an emergency climate motion at full council. Uh, we, we also, you may know that uh, Tameside administers the Greater Manchester Pension Fund and a lot of works um, in, involved in that. And again, the pension fund has committed, uh, you know, to, to uh, as quickly as it's, as it's possible, you know, within the confines of, of, of all of the very complex uh, business world and, and um, money world, uh, to, to actually look at all our investments with a view to moving towards green investments um, as quickly as we can. Uh, we have engaged uh, a company and, and it's termed just transition so that we can um, have a, a sensible transition program of disinvestment, you know, in areas that um, are not as green as, as we think they need to be these days. It, you can't just switch the tap off uh, in the investment world. I'm sure you know that. Um, but we, we can do things and influence, actually. We can be quite influential with those companies that are not uh, as, as green as we would want them to be, um, you know, because of our shareholding in them. So, you know, we, we can also continue that kind of work. Um, so, uh, further pre-existing programmes which conform to the values uh, that the CCIN and have now um, have all been incorporated into our strat strategies. And you mentioned earlier, Amanda, when we were chatting, uh, that does include the Grafton Centre, you know, very much buy into the cooperative values. Uh, we also have uh, the uh, Loxley House, uh, the Together Centre is another community centre which we run on a similar but not identical basis to the Grafton Centre. Uh, we have uh, new arrangements now with the voluntary sector uh, that were, was agreed last year. So again, moving very, very quickly to all of those cooperative values that I know are very important. And so I think closing, I think what it's done for us, uh, being a member of CCIN, it does afford us the opportunity to actually focus and engage uh, in, in, on, the, on the way in which that we, I suppose, work with our residents, work with, with our, our businesses and, you know, move forward as, as a, a local council. We, we need to ask the right questions. We need to know that we're providing the kind of services that people expect and want and need. And obviously, you know, we will continue to do our best within the, uh, you know, very severe constraints at the moment of not just the pandemic, but the financial uh, situation that that place is on us as well going forward. But nevertheless, we will continue to do our very, very best. And we will always continue to learn, always with uh, uh, the cooperative ethos in mind. And, uh, you know, we're very, very pleased that we made this journey. And uh, I would definitely uh, recommend to any other local authority that is thinking about it, please don't hesitate, just do it. It's well worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Brenda. That's a, a smashing message to, to finish with there. And uh, yeah, great to hear about the sort of uh, fairly speedy journey that you took to, to becoming a cooperative council. It was, it was very speedy. Yeah, very and some, some really great examples there of cooperation in action. Um, and uh, Tameside is one of the um, one of the case studies on the induction, in the induction pack. So you can read, read more about that as well. So that, that was great. Thank you very much indeed, Brenda. So Amanda, do you want to pop this? Yes, I will. We'll I, also did, yes, um, I also worked with, um, with Loxley House when I worked over in Tameside. Oh, yeah. So it was nice to hear, to hear them giving a name check as well. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, just... so we're going to move on now then to have a chat about the uh, CCIN induction. Um, apologies, my, my um, video kept flicking off earlier. So if it, if it does flick off, I will just keep talking. Um, so I'll just briefly explain the uh, the induction program to you and how it came about, but then more importantly, we'll give you a chance to have a little look at it and then to consider some little, some questions um, 
as we mentioned at the beginning of the session, as Amanda mentioned. So um, the induction programme then came about from the action plan that the Exec Oversight Committee from CCIN and the BMP board put together. Um, and um, we had Councillor Sharon Taylor on a session with us yesterday and uh, she said that, uh, you know, the, the induction programme came about from the, the desire to want to put some resources together that could be used by potential um, councils, potential members of CCIN and also existing members. And it was originally written for councillors, but it's been recognised, acknowledged that, you know, it's really useful for officers as well. And it has been used by a variety of people already uh, in that way, certainly the part one, and we're rolling out the part two very shortly. Um, so the, the induction programme was initially uh, built upon the uh, resources that CCIN had put together in a, an introductory pack and case studies. And then we built on that to create um, a part one and part two, which we'll detail in a moment. And we're using the uh, Cooperative College Learning Platform, which again, we'll explain in a little bit more detail shortly, um, but it allows us to um, use existing videos that CCIN and councils had available, and we've provided links and signposts to others uh, and other, other resources. And also, although not compulsory in the, the training, we've uh, built in some reflective activities, which we would encourage people to, uh, to complete to get the <coughs> of, of the training programme. And we're going to have a look at an example of that shortly as well. Thanks. So part one, um, phase one, we, was the sort of introductory level. As I said, this built upon the, the resources that CCIN had uh, already, and we put them into a, an electronic form, so it's much more accessible. Um, and we um, explain the reasoning behind the, uh, the package. Um, the Induction programme talks about um, the, the idea of the network and, and the sort of benefits that you can get from membership from the network. It talks about the who, how, what, so um, a bit more detail about um, CCIN. And as we said, provides some case studies. Short, uh, phase one provides some sort of short introductory case studies. And Amanda will now just briefly tell you about phase two. Yeah, so phase two is, was designed to be a bit more in depth and actually look at you know, what does, that, what does being a cooperative council actually involve, you know, in practice on the ground? Um, and so, you know, thinking about the kinds of ways in which different councils or even sort of other, you know, other sorts of initiatives about developing the identity and practice of being working more cooperatively, um, as, especially as such a sort of big organisation as a local authority. Um, and being able to identify that cooperative difference so what is that difference that um you know that so that when someone asks you what's what so what being a being a cooperative council you know what does that actually mean in practice that you can identify those markers that that mean that you do work cooperatively like some of the um examples that, that brenda gave earlier and so then also bringing it back to the the values and principles um the as well as the um the ica the international cooperative alliance values and principles but also looking at the um you know the ccin statement of values and principles and again um, reflecting on some case studies and focusing on two approaches used by councils um or use you know in different areas around focusing on placemaking and community wealth building you know what do these actually mean and how can we um, embed those sort of practices into um, you know the council work um, and in terms of case studies um, in phase one they were very much um, case studies of initiatives whereas the phase two is much more about what what's the what's that the council doing as a whole you know what what types of different ways of working um is it involved in and what kind of initiatives has it got um you know and even you know what kind of measurement tools well how is it measuring that difference and how is it you know showing its impact in different areas and so with the, the focus there is on these four councils um tameside kirklees barking and dagenham and hillingdon in london thanks amanda so the, the CCI induction has been built on our learning platform. It's accessible from the CCIM website and phase two will be launched very shortly. So that will be available and it's free of charge. Um, so it, it, our, our platform um, it, it allows us to uh, create learning programs that you, know, you can complete on any device, so telephone, tablet, PC, and, and any time. Um, so you can do it on, your bus, on the bus, on your phone or at home or in the office. 
there are loads of different opportunities um, and the, the programs do um, stop and start so wherever you finish you can pick up again next time so it's it's intuitive in that way um, and the the platform is a great platform and um, Amanda and colleagues have done an amazing job of getting all sorts of really attractive and um, engaging resources on there so videos graphics um, and you'll, you'll get a chance to see that uh, yourselves in a moment um, and as I say we can we can include a, a whole host of resources and activities on the training program but also provide links and signposts to other really useful resources so um, you know if you want to to know about values and principles about the CCI and about what other people are doing this this is a really really useful resource for that so we're going to give you an opportunity to have a little look and hopefully if you look in the chat uh, you will see that I've put a link in there to uh, Rise Articulate. If you'd all just like to have a little click on that link that will take you through to a, a, an extract from um, the phase two CCIN induction um, and you can have a little play around. Uh, Amanda do you want to say anything about the, act the, the, the activity that you've given in the example there? Um. It's well. It's mainly just that um, it's to showcase um, an aspect of one of the the case studies from the um, second phase of the induction. So it's just to sort of if you just want to have like a little scroll through and have a have a look. It's just a section of one of those case studies to show to just give you a demo about um, you know the kind of things that are covered in those um, in those case studies. So if, if you want to, um, if you click on the link and then click on start course, which is in the, the, the sort of head banner, then, um, you know, you, you'll be able to scroll through that. And if you could do like a, a thumbs up on your screen or, or sort of give us a little bit of an indication when you've, when you've uh, you know, finished having a look. So if we give you, say, five minutes to just quickly do that, and then we'll come back again. Thanks, Amanda. just quite conscious that we've not got a lot of time left because um, we want to have a little bit of time for questions and answers at the end so if I can just invite everyone back to the uh, the main zoom room that would be great
So um, because there's only a few of us, um, the next activity that we wanted to do um, was to have a little discussion and reflection of um, you know um, the, the sort of unique characteristics of your council area. I mean, Brenda touched on this when she was talking. You know, the the value of of um, you know building up that kind of best practice, but also that acknowledgement that every council area is unique. You know, we've all got you know a mix of like urban and rural locations, different types of areas within those boroughs. You know, very, you know, some of them, you know, very sort of mixed populations and some, you know, with good transport links, others not so much. So there's all of these different factors that come into play. Um, and so what we'd like is to sort of get people to, to reflect on, you know, what is unique or exceptional about the council area. Um, and, you know, what, what the, the challenges and strengths of, of the area that you're in as well and, and thinking about about that kind of, um, you know, how can we work more cooperatively when we've got these very sort of unique sort of scenarios in each of those council areas. So, let me share. So if we just stay in this room, and rather than going off into breakouts, because there's only a few of us, um, I think, uh, you know, what, what, like, for example, Kate, what's kind of unique or exceptional about where you're you're based down in in Torbay. I think our our uniqueness. It's difficult to say what's unique, isn't it? Because you know we're we're a seaside resort, yes. but it's that, that that sunny that sunny persona that we're trying to a attract visitors and residents to kind of is a facade for some quite serious issues of deprivation. Yeah. So. It, it's balancing the need to promote ourselves as a wonderful place to come and visit and yet yeah. still need to put in those resources to make sure that we're getting the mm. support that we need for our population which is mm. is you know and working with the rest of the southwest authorities to get that leveling up agenda seen down here as well as across mm. the northern um areas yeah yeah, because the southwest is a is a is a, you know has a, I think it's just like anywhere outside of London basically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they never you know I think that there's certain areas which are a sort of pre, you know people automatically think of areas of deprivation and they never think of those places in the south that that are also suffering from deprivation. Yeah, you know it, it's that being at the end of a one way street type scenario that we've got mm. down here that you know. We, we've got a, a fantastic location, but we've only got half of the boundary that places like Birmingham and Manchester have, you know, so there's only one direction that people can go to, yeah. to expand for housing, for jobs, you know, because half of our, half of our boundary is a bit wet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, and it's unique and that's very, you know, there are unique, you know, that's very different from being, you know, a, a local authority that's that's inland um, in terms of, you know, and, and often it's not, you know, your focus, you know, probably focusing more on a kind of attracting tourists, you know, don't, and, and sort of visitors, whereas other other local authorities, that wouldn't be their main focus necessarily if they're not in that kind of... Sort of no, and, then it, and it's balancing the economy back up as well yeah. to make sure that we're not completely dependent on the tourist industry, because obviously at the moment that's really causing us a massive problem we've yeah. actually got a um a huge high-tech industry in in torbay um and so it's building up that um narrative as well to make people realize that actually there's high-tech jobs available down here that it mm -hmm. to our students to our, our our youngsters that they don't need to move outside or move too far away they can still have that um you know dif different careers it isn't all about retail and, and hospitality. Thank you, Kate. And John, have you got any, anything you'd like to add about the area you're from? Is John there? Oh, I don't seem to be able to get John. Might ask Thomas then. I know you're also 
in Tameside, Thomas, but you know, you've sort of come into Tameside from outside, so you might have a different perspective. You know, what oh, yes. is unique or exceptional about Tameside? Well, Tameside USB are its. So can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. 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 Tameside USB is its seven towns, and um, all seven towns have different challenges and different strengths. Um, for example, Ashton, as you know, has got superb transport links and um, it's got quite a lot of investment going on in the, the CBD area, as it were. But other places like Mosley or, um, or Hyde are much more rural. So of, of all the seven towns, there's different strengths and there's different weaknesses. What we try to do is make sure that we have a plan or a strategy which incorporates the geographical advantages uh, for um, Staley Bridge, for example, um, uh, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant sort of mountainside town. Um, mm -hmm. But again, when we talk about deprivation in Staley Bridge, uh, at the town of Staley Bridge, uh, the, 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 dispar the disparity of wealth is, is huge going from the top end of the, of, of the town down to the, the bottom end of the town. So when you try and look at what you're going to do with the town centre there and how you're going to bring all that different, form, you know, those different forms of wealth in, um, we have to really sort of advance what the town strategy is going to be there. Um, we've been working on that, funnily enough, and we've been doing that in cooperation with the, um, with the Mayor's um, Town Challenge, the Greater Manchester Mayor's Town Challenge, Andy Burnham's Town Challenge. And we've been working quite well with that. Um, but on the flip side, we've got Denton, which is Brenda's town. And with that, we've, we've done investment there in our leisure industry. And we've got a wellness centre. And Denton, the Denton Wellness Centre focuses not just on, you know, going swimming or, or you know, going to the gym. It actually has, is a community hub, which we've opened out to people that can come and play as bands there. There's, an, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a roof cinema, um, so people can um, sit there with families and things. And so it's about wellness, literally, not just leisure. And so um, I, I think in terms of we're quite versatile, even if I say so myself um, and, and we accept that actually there's not one cut way to do things uh, as you would in, in Manchester for example which is very strict on its strategic regeneration frameworks its local plan and stuff Tameside is much more versatile because it has to be so it's USPs oh it's USP sorry of the seven towns is also it's great it's great advantage but it's also it's a uh, weakness yeah I hope that's a fair answer Brenda yeah that, that's a uh... I'll take that, Tom, thank yeah. you. I wonder, Amanda, could, could I ask a question of Kate? That's yes, interesting. Course, yeah. Kate, I, I'm just wondering about um, whether in, in Torbay, in, in your area, there is any kind of an impact uh, with people perhaps buying up houses to have as holiday homes rather than you know, permanent homes. Do you have that issue there? And if we, so, we know what, what are the feelings of people? We, we don't have that issue in Torbay as much. Mm -hmm. um, I actually live outside of Torbay and it's a big, it's a bigger issue in the, in the area I live. So I live in the South Hams district. Right. Um, and it, it's a, it, you know, sort of from a personal perspective, it's a, it's a double edged sword really. Um, there's, there's the issue obviously of um, locals not being able to afford houses, especially mm -hmm. younger yeah. people. Um, but the second homeowners and the tourists and the, uh, you know, so the second homeowners also tend to rent their homes out as well as, as holiday mm. lets. And there's a huge amount of income that comes into us right. from, from those second homes. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's the winter is when you tend to notice it when there's certain, yeah. certain villages that are just, you know, dark, there's no lights on at all. And mm. um, yeah. But, but from Torbay's point of view, it's not such an issue. It, it's still more of a traditional um, seaside resort, mm. so mainly holiday um, hotels and um, self-catering mm. apartments and, hol and holiday parks. Thank you. No, that's interesting because it is, you know, there are very sort of unique issues, but mm. there's often sort of um, solutions that can sort of be appropriate for multiple um, you know, multiple types of challenges, isn't there? You know, and sort of yes. just different ways of working. But I think, you know, what you were saying earlier, Brenda, is the key for a lot of this is actually that resident buy-in, isn't it? Mm. You know, I think yeah. that, um, and that's, that's the kind of, 
hopefully that that's the difference with being more of a cooperative council because i know that lots of councils do have some kind of you know people are moving more towards having that resident buy-in but um you know doing it cooperatively is is, is different than just having like right. a consultation isn't it you know yes. Yes. so how do you change that mindset because you know we're, we're a, a new cooperative council and we have been consulting with residents for years and years and years, but we still get the, well, you're only playing lip service to it. You're not, um, you're not going to change your mind. It doesn't really matter. How, how do you try and, how do you get that buy-in better? I would say perseverance. I, I would say that the, you know, you, you will never be able to satisfy everyone. Uh, that, that is a fact, isn't it? But I, th I think there are many areas and, and I, th I think, you know, not, not to try to bite off too much at the, at the beginning. If you take on some, what you might term, smaller uh, issues, let's say, that, that exist, and, and you, you're able to demonstrate that you've listened and you've acted, you know, on the, maybe not totally, but you've, you've gone some way to trying to satisfy, uh, you know, the sort of views of residents or the demands of residents, um, then I, th I think it, it's, it's one of those things you can only do it by demonstrating that you are listening just saying it doesn't work you've got to do it as well yeah. and I think if, if you can um, look, look at some specific examples of where you can make a change that has reacted to uh, whether it's a group of residents whether it's a group of business owners whatever but you know, you can demonstrate you've listened and you've acted on that. It does start to resonate and it does, people do start to say, well, they have listened. I may not have got everything I would have liked, but they've listened and they've done something about it. And I think you've just got to do it to, to get that message across, to be honest. Uh, and you, you, you've got to have that constant uh, buy-in with, with you, your counsellors. You know that they have to buy into it and they have to be out there making sure that people know about it uh, you know you bombard them with information basically thanks uh, just to say i think the workshops run to time now so yes yeah i was just going to say that we're just going to going to round it up there but um just want to say to everyone you know thanks for i mean i've i found it super interesting um and so thank you to everyone for, for taking part and for especially to to you brenda you know i was really thank you for preparing and you know having a having a really interesting um, and engaging presentation my pleasure thank you for inviting me